Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Global History. I'm your host, Langella Sensei. So, guys, last time we were here, we talked a lot about the Renaissance uh, origins. We talked about how it started in Italy. We talked, we really focused on how uh, the Middle Ages was really seen as basically the negative part of European history, and they kind of want to get away from that. So they really jumpstarted into this new idealism uh, known as humanistic uh, or humanism, or really instead of focusing on a lot of religious beliefs, or it's really focused on the human achievement itself, and that's really what sets someone apart. Because the Middle Ages were seen as really being someone that was a, a kind of a, a warrior on the battlefield, a religious man or a woman. Really, that's what put them into the higher limelight. Uh, but in the Renaissance, it's really based on how much they know how much knowledge they have how much uh you know skill set do they have in all parts of society we talked about how Italy had a, several different advantages that that set them to be really the perfect place for the start of the Renaissance, really because of their thriving cities, their uh, their location when it comes to uh, trading and even having a, a a heritage of Greek and Roman culture, and then having now a, a really uh, a trading class or merchant class that actually had a lot of say or political power during this time period, um, and that just a new idea of how people should live when it comes to um, you know the Middle Ages. Was, was so deadly that everyone just had a new lease on life, that instead of worrying about uh, the little things, it was really just, I'm just going to try to enjoy my life, and I'm going to try to learn as much as possible, and try to enjoy my life as much as possible. Um, and we talked about how uh, the different merchant families grew in, in power, uh, they looked to really try to mirror themselves after old Roman and Greek cultures uh, for their future. Um, and then we talk about uh, just the idea that people are just worried about the here and now, and they're really uh, not really focused on specifically religion at, uh, in, a, in a sense, but really just saying, listen, God's not going to be mad at us for owning material, right? They're not, he's not going to be mad at us for having a big house. He wants us to live by him, but we should also try to enjoy our life in general. Um, we talked about how there was a focus on arts um, and this new, uh, they want to see new things. They want to beautify uh, Europe in general. So they focus, They try to become more influential. They try to do that by investing in art. Um, we talked about how there is a mindset of Renaissance men and women. Uh, basically, the idea is that a Renaissance man would basically try to learn as much things as possible. A Renaissance woman would be highly educated um, and would be witty, charming, um, and, and they would, uh, you know, stay in their lane, right? That's really what a Renaissance woman was when you compare that to Renaissance men who is basically there is no limit on them, right? That's the big difference. Um we talked about really now, we, well, we talked a lot about art, really, how art changed completely. Um, medieval art was focused on religious you know, symbols or, or people, and Renaissance art was really focused on the, on the human being. Focus on their the details of who they are. Focus on perspective, like what certain things might be bigger than others, and and really the focus on uh, just the expression of of human beings. We talked about a lot of different famous uh, artists. Um, Michelangelo, we talked about Donatello, we talked about uh, Leonardo da Vinci was probably the most famous because he was considered the, the the Renaissance man, a true Renaissance man because if he was a master in all different facets, whether it was painting, sculpting, inventing, uh, scientists, all these different things. Um, uh, and then we uh, mentioned uh, Raphael as well. Um, these were all famous painters uh, and also names of Ninja Turtles, if you didn't know that. Um, and then we even talked about women having a, basically certain women were famous for their art uh, exploits as well, which is important to understand. And and I think I finished off by explaining how basically for for the men it was a higher chance of them becoming famous for their for you know learning things. For women it was a lot more difficult. But you can definitely make a difference. You can definitely pick out a difference between the Middle Ages women. Uh, and Renaissance women, right? Renaissance, Renaissance women had more of an ability to become uh, known, all right? But now let's take a look at writing, right? We focus a lot about art, but we didn't really talk a lot about the written expression. The written expression is extremely important, okay? So let's take a look at written expression. Now, it, written expression changes quite a lot, and actually the, a lot of techniques that were um, that are really focused on back then um, were actually use today all right so for instance um the use of vernacular vernacular is basically the idea instead of it because in the middle ages everything that was written was in latin because latin was the main uh, main language that the church used 
But now they're starting to use vernacular, which basically is considered their native language. So you would start to see if there was an, an Italian writer, they would write in Italian. Uh, if there was someone from Spain, they would write in Spain. And it was based on the specific area in which you lived in. And the reason why this is important was because this is more of a self-expression. Um, it, it, it was more it was more personal. It was more based on what you as an individual would think about certain subjects. And these these subjects varied no, basically endless, right? There was a bunch of different subjects that they could talk about, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, war or history or uh, living just the life of a, of a merchant or a poor individual. It would it would range right completely. Right. So and that's what's important is that a lot of writing that was going on in the Middle Ages was based on religion. Right. And then it changed. And now it was more personal, it was more, you know, just the ideas of like a memoir today. Right. That's kind of what they look at. It's like a personal take on what you believe or what you're thinking. And that's that's what's really important. OK. Um, some famous people we can look at. Uh, Francisco uh, Petrarch. Um, he was probably one of the earliest and most influential humanists uh, that wrote. Um, he was really famous for his uh, 14 line sonnets. Um, and he, he actually wrote a lot about women. Yeah. There was a, a very mysterious woman named Laura. They didn't even provide you a last name for him that he used for his muse is really, he would write poems about, um, uh, you know, women, or he would write poems about, uh, you know, his life. It was really a lot of different things. Um, another famous writer, Giovanni, uh, uh, Bocchio, Bocchio, um, yeah, yeah, Boccaccio. Um, he was best known for his realistic, really uh, short stories. He would write. Um, probably one of his most famous short stories was actually uh, he had a group of characters that were uh, really trying to basically live during the bubonic plague. Um, and this was uh, it really tried to show um, really the humanistic approach to a lot of these these events that a lot of people probably didn't even know about. Um. I mean, it, well, reality is people knew about the bubonic plague, but they didn't really think about, you know, whether, uh, you know, some people's life. And he would tell a lot of these uh, these stories about people. So they may not have been true stories, but they were really stories about true events. Right. And he was famous for, for doing that. And, and his characters had um, really a full circle approach to them. They had a lot of individuality um, and they would really a lot of these stories had a, a rise and fall very similar to a lot of our stories we see today. Right. You can look at how there are specific, um, you know, fiction books that are based on real events going on at that time period. And they might not be true true stories, but they seem true. They feel true. And that's what, that, that's really a lot of writing did that. Now, one of the most famous writers during the Renaissance was, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, right? And he was probably one of the most cynical as well. Um, and, and the reason he, he's written a lot of different books, um, but, Probably one of his famous was known as the Prince. Okay, um, and basically he examines really the the human individual, and when he looks at uh, who what what makes them up and who they are as people, um, and this was considered a a political guidebook. Okay, um, now what he and a lot of people we even in AP government politics um, we look at his writing too in the beginning because we try to we try to explain where a lot of um, a lot of colonists get their ideas about how politics should be run. And Machiavelli was one of the people that did influence a lot of colonists too in his in his uh, in his verbiage and what he believed in. Now, one of the big things he he says outright in his book is that basically people are corrupt, right? People are selfish, and they're always going to try uh, to basically get an upper hand on others. All right, and that's really one of the big things that he focuses on. Okay, um, and that in order for a ruler to stay in power with all these different corrupt people around him is they need to be uh, as strong as a lion. And this is a quote, strong as a lion, shrewd as a fox. And he must be able to really out, out maneuver his, his enemies, right? Be able to basically do what's right for the state, right? Even though it might be morally wrong, it might be bad, it might be messed up, but if it's for the betterment of everyone, then that's the route they should go. And now this is a, a famous excerpt from the prince, and I'll read it for you guys here. From this arises the question whether it is better to be loved more than feared or feared more than loved. The reply is that one ought to be both feared and loved. But as, as it is difficult for two to go together, it is much safer to be feared than loved. If one of the two has to be, uh, has to be wanting... 
For it may be said of men in general that they are ungrateful, valuable, uh, dis- dis- dismemblers, which means liars, anxious to avoid danger and uh, covetous of gain. As long as you benefit them, they are entirely yours. They offer you their blood, their goods, their life, and their children. As I have before said, when the, necess- when the necessity is remote, but when it approaches, they revolt. And the prince who has relied solely on their words without making preparations is ruined. So based on this primary source, guys, I want you to answer, um, I want you guys to answer this question here, all right? This main, this main idea question here. Does Machiavelli think that a prince should be prefer, uh, prefer to be loved or feared and why? So we're going to watch this, this quick clip here. It's, it's going to talk about Ma, uh, Machiavelli's The Prince and explains what his idealism. So let's take a look um, at this clip. A nation state can either be a republic or a principality, and either old or new. An old hereditary state that has been passed down the generations is easy to rule, but taking control and then holding on to a new state is difficult. The difficulty is reduced if you personally supervise it. An old hereditary state, such as a monarchy, can be taken by destroying the entire royal family. This is what Alexander the Great did to conquer and hold on to the Persian Empire of Darius III. However, states that are used to freedom must be crushed. For those who are not yet princes, it is possible to rise to become one by carrying out two steps. Follow the example of those in the past who saw their opportunities, and be well armed. To keep hold of a new state securely, all resistance must be destroyed by using cruel, swift and firm methods, but then benefits to the people should be given gradually. A prince must win the favour of the people and dispel any hostility, but he will only be truly secure when he can raise his own army to defend against all comers. Mercenaries cannot be relied on, neither can other people's armies. To be successful, a prince must read history, study war, and know his own land. He must give the appearance of being good, but also know how to be evil. He should not be afraid to be thought of as mean, as giving liberally and spending freely will lead to ruin. He also shouldn't worry about being thought of as cruel, as fear is one of the only things he can control. A prince should be willing to use cunning if needed, and deception if necessary. He may or may not be loved, but as long as he is not hated, he is secure. Fortresses are of little use, as even though they can be used to defend against outsiders, they do not stop you being betrayed by your own people. A prince must be purposeful, determined and unwavering. He must clearly follow one path or another. He should encourage art and craft, commerce and agriculture, entertain his people with spectacles and festivities, rewarding those who honour his state. Only capable servants should be used by a prince and he should keep them under control. Anybody who flatters must be avoided. Machiavelli claimed that the once powerful princes of Italy lost their power not through misfortune, but by their own inaction and indecisiveness. Fortune directs half of our actions, but the other half is left for us to direct through hard work, cautiousness and virtue. Fortune needs to be beaten and dominated. It is often like a torrential river that cannot be stopped, but during periods of calm, preparations can be made to control and minimise the damage. Machiavelli concludes by stating that a leader is needed that will follow the advice in the book, to conquer Italy and free her from the barbarians. It's a pretty good video, I, I really like it, I think they did a pretty good job explaining everything about the prince, um, but Machiavelli is a famous writer, right? and, and, and the idea of being feared or loved is a constant idea that a lot of monarchs and a lot of leaders of society always try uh, really to, to battle that that relationship between one and the other. So uh, we're gonna actually going to do a worksheet on uh, Machiavelli's The Prince um, for today. But let's let's finish up with the PowerPoint before we get to that point. So let's um, let's finish up here. Put. Um, one of the probably even the most famous women writers actually had a, a really a great amount of influence over the Renaissance society, um, but but may didn't wrote a lot about personal subjects, but not really a lot about politics. And that was Victoria Colonna. Um, she actually was born into a noble family. Uh, she um, she 
had basically uh, was married to Marquise of Pescara. Um, and he was away on, on military camp, uh, campaigns a lot, and he had wrote um, really. I mean, she had wrote a lot of a lot of sonnets, a lot of different types of writing um, that really talked about her personal emotions whenever she would have to watch um, as he went away uh, to battle and everything. And and she actually had exchanged a lot of her uh, sonnets with Michelangelo um, and actually helped. Uh, Castiglione uh, published The Courtier, uh, which is actually, for, for a woman of the time period, um, she she was phenomenal. Like the fact that she was able to do so much to influence the Renaissance writing uh, is is fantastic, and it's impressive uh, for for her for any woman to really do that during this time period. Um, now she writes uh, she wrote a sonnet uh, to her husband as he was going away to the Battle of Ravenna uh, in 1512, and here is the sonnet. Um, uh, here, uh, here is the writing that um, the primary source I have for you guys on the PowerPoint. But now in this perilous assault, in this horrible, uh, pitiless battle that has so hardened my mind and heart, your great valor has shown you an equal to Hector and Achilles. But what good is it to me, sorrowful, abandoned? Your uncertain enterprises do not hurt you. But we who wait, mournfully grieving, are wounded by doubt and fear. You men, driven by rage, considering nothing but your honor, calmly go off, shouting with great fury to confront danger. We remain with fear in our heart and grieve on our brow for you. Sister longs for brother, wife for husband, mother for son. It's a pretty emotional uh, poem that she had wrote. Um, basically it, explaining well really the the uh you know the mindset of a lot of um a lot of the women uh as they watch the men battle one another for these po- pointless titles these pointless land um and it, it she was famous for writing these really personal uh whether it was poems or just writing uh just writing pieces in general um but she, she was like like I said already, she was phenomenal for being able to have a, so much influence over uh, Renaissance writing for this time period because not a lot of people would listen or even read a woman's work. Um, but she was able to do accomplish so much for even though she was being she was a woman during uh, this time period. So let's guys take a look at these written uh, these multiple choice questions here. You're gonna do all six of these here. Um, all right, so make sure you guys get these done. These are on your PowerPoint questions worksheet. And also get the main ideas done as well. Uh, these are also on your worksheet too. All right, guys, that's going to be it for us today. I, as, as I said to you before, you are going to do the Machiavelli, uh, the Prince worksheet. Um, and and then you go make sure you do the PowerPoint questions um worksheet the catch up with section one so that you aren't caught behind on everything and on top of that make sure you try to get done the chapter uh the reading guides and just do section one since we are just finished with section one right now all right guys that's it for me have a good one